So to start, um, there was some big news this morning between Securitize, Avalanche, and KKR, which is a massive investment company with like $419 billion assets under management. Uh, if you guys want to talk a little bit about the news and how it pertains to the subject of the matter today, we can start with that. Yes, yeah, so it, the, the, it was very timely having the panel here and specifically this panel with what we announced this morning. So basically, what we announced is that, um, you know, for the first time, you know, a major private equity firm uh, like KKR is going to tokenize a portion of one of their private equity uh, funds and make it available in a public blockchain avalanche in this case uh, for individual investors to basically buy, you know, a position in these funds that is typically you know, available only for institutional investors. So we are securitized, we're playing a number of roles here. So we're managing the, the field to the fund. We're also doing the tokenization <coughs> uh, with our technology and it's been offering our broker dealer platform. So we're pretty excited about it because we think it's a very, it's a huge milestone in the industry of really bringing quality uh, assets into the tokenization space. I mean, I have to congratulate you, Carlos, because you and I have been working on tokenizing and providing as access to private and hard to find securities for a long time. And you guys have built an incredible um, compliance mechanism with all the right licenses and you've continued to push away at it. And I think this is like really, Jackie, the beginning of a long positive trend where private markets, tokenization is going to provide great opportunities for both LPs, the users, as well as the content providers, I call them, which is the issuers. And I would congratulate both Carlos and John. I think you know, what, the way that this is happening on, on Avalanche is, is a phenomenal development. And quite frankly, you know, it's happening. I mean, this is about you know, blockchain being applied to some of these traditional financial services products. Um, this is a, a $4 billion fund. And so this development, I think, is very noteworthy. And it's just the beginning of a, a very long process of more, more to come in this area. Yeah, and just to take a step back now, an overview, like going into the panel, you all have different perspectives, <laughs> different backgrounds, careers uh, to get to where you are today, of course. So I, I'm curious if we could just start with you saying kind of like how you see institutions and LPs getting into Web3, like what's it gonna take right now? So obviously, you know, when I started in the industry in, in 2017, you know, there was already discussions about institutions and LPs getting into Web3, et cetera. But the, the reality is, I think that there was not enough, let's say, infrastructure and, you know, regulatory clarity for, for certain things to happen. And, and I think fast forward five years from now, first, we have much better blockchain infrastructure, um, more reliable. And, and then at the same time, we have a bit more getting closer to having a, a better regulatory clarity in terms of what institutions and LPs can, can do that. So I, I think that the next five years, we're going to see an explosion of adoption of Web3 in kind of like two different directions, right? So I think that one aspect is, you know, institutions and LPs buying into, into native crypto assets, so it's like Bitcoin or Ethereum. But the other one is what we just discussed about it, which is also these institutions being able to, you know, access, uh, you know, Web3 and public blockchains as a way to, you know, democratize access to their uh, products and investments to, to a, a bigger pool of uh, investors that today don't have access to uh, to traditional cap private capital markets. I think it's going to be three or four different trends that are all hitting right now at the same time. That's going to allow an inflection for this space to really grow. Um, the technology, when Carlos and I first started on this journey, frankly, you know, permissionless blockchains did not have the scale or the cost efficiency and the benefits that the issuers needed back then in 17 and 2018. Uh, in terms of uh, commercial ability and people believing in this technology and people wanting to adopt it, we were just far from that as well. And then from the user perspective, I think they need a better UI UX. So they have more of like that Schwab experience or something. And that's starting to happen. Still, that needs to be improved, um, but it's getting there. And lastly, I think regulatory clarity. Now, it was really unclear four or five years ago. It's getting better with people at Securitize and, and solving a lot of those problems. And I think these four things are conflating to now potential liftoff for the space. I, I think that's a great summary. I, I totally agree with both of those comments. And I would just say that, you know, as part of my practice, I deal with other asset managers. And, you know, I'll just say this in the asset management community, there are, you know, you'd be amazed at the number of uh, funds that are out there that have teams now who are looking very closely at what's happening with blockchain, how is that potentially changing 
our business, how is it changing, how we bring funds to market, how we connect with customers, uh, and how we do things. Certainly in the alt space, it is a leading area of this and private markets, it's a little easier from the regulatory perspective to do things for these sort of exempt securities right now. But, you know, people are looking at it. You know, I think that the number of projects that are underway will, will I think, start to amaze people. And again, with all these forces in place and, and moving together, um, it really seems like some, some significant developments here are probably sooner rather than later. Yeah, there's no shortage of people trying. Um, that's the good news. But it took innovative team with such brand like KKR, I think, to really put this on the map. And that's why I think we're all so excited about this one. The first one is the hardest one, as they always say. And I think that, you know, that the first one is not anybody, but it's uh, a firm like KKR. I think that's going to be a major, uh, you know, trigger and wake up call for all the asset managers out there. Uh, to realize that you know this is the technology and the platforms and the public utility one that they need to be using to put their products in the hands of a broader set of investors right. are you having conversations with other asset managers like are they interested as well or? yeah we've talked to a lot <laughs> and um and i think that you know i really got some calls this morning after <laughs> the announcement happened because it was in the, in the wall street journal so it's got a lot of uh coverage so i think that you know everybody was looking at this like in, in 2018 when, when we started pitching this to to asset managers you know sometimes just to say that the word blockchain and token will just throw you out of the meeting right because it was a very bad connotation after the ICO space in 2017 and all that happened in the industry but i think these days as, as brett said all of them they have teams looking at this it's just that they're all looking at who's going to be the first one uh, moving so i think that this uh you know announcement from, from kkr is going to definitely start pushing everybody to do it what kind of Web3 trends are you seeing kind of like proliferate right now within private markets and investors' behaviors? So on the, um, this, I'll break this down between um, the issuers and the users. You know, the users, the LPs, I think there is definitely a trend towards looking for more private shares, alternative assets, and figuring out ways to get there, not just necessarily in blockchain, but in general. And there's a large market there. I think Oliver Wyman Consulting consider thinks that you know they're forecasting 1.5 trillion dollars of assets will be bought in private markets individually by 2025 or something in two or three years. I think a big part of that will be uh, on Web3 or through blockchains as the efficiencies of Web3 become evident to everyone. Um, but on the Issuer side, I think the technology behind underlying blockchains with the instant finality of an avalanche and, and the scale of a lot of these layer ones now, um, they're going to see benefits from an operational perspective so that it makes it more cost effective for them to go reach out for smaller tickets. There's a lot of costs and intermediaries associated with um, doing this. So in the old days, you had to have large tickets to amortize that, you know, maintenance, call it of that LP unit. And it's frankly not as profitable to have smaller tickets. But with the efficiencies with blockchain and permissionless blockchain, you can actually uh, make it so it's cost effective to actually go for some of these smaller tickets now. And from an investor perspective, I think there's two main trends that happen that are gonna change you know, how investors behave the next 10 years. Right? The first one is, is the wealth transfer from let's say the boomer generation into the you know, millennials and above, right? Uh, there's trillions and trillions of dollars that are going to shift hands from people that are today are 65, 70, 75 years old that are used to traditional wealth managers taking them out to the golf course and inviting them to, to a game and then, you know, managing their money and not doing anything themselves, not being uh, digitally savvy, etc. to a generation of people that are first digitally savvy. They're, they're used to, you know, work with, uh, you know, digital wallets, you know, blockchain and non-blockchain, but hopefully in the future all blockchain and crypto enable and then they also want to take their own investment decisions right they just don't want somebody to tell them what they're going to be doing with their money they want to have access to these products and be able to you know do some of their own research and take the investment decision and of course they want everything to be digital right they're used to a digital experience for everything else they do in their life so so sometimes they don't understand why you know investing in, in a in a fund it requires all this paperwork around and intermediaries and things like that so i think those those two trends um of how investors behave are also what the asset managers are seeing because obviously they need to cater to this new generation of people and, and it's not insignificant in, in the us just only with accredited investors there's 13.6 million people that more than 10 percent of the households that collectively they manage 75 trillion dollars 
and that today have no access, you know, very, very limited access to private capital markets. So this technology can actually open up uh, you know, that market to both those investors and for these asset managers to go there and do these new bigger investors. And just to put that a little bit differently, as you know, as was mentioned, when the break-even point for an investor goes down, then what's happening is a lot of the sort of universe of ultra high net worth individuals that would get access to that before is sort of moving down to just high net worth individuals. And that's a very big market, right? And so as that market opens up, you know, uh, there really needs to be fund managers really need to look at how they can access that. This is a technology that, that, that does that. And the other thing is there's a, you know, as we, we look at the way that the issuer is connecting to the customer. Right. And so, you know, as Carlos mentioned, you have traditional wealth managers, but increasingly you have the ability of putting something out there, having that information recorded on the blockchain, knowing that customer information and connecting with it and being able to communicate and have a, sort of a more enhanced relationship with the customer. So I think that is one of the, the emerging trends as well. I mean, so when I talk to my parents, speaking of boomers, um, they remind me how in the 70s when mm -hmm. they graduated college or whatever, um, you couldn't, no one really thought about buying individual stocks. They bought mutual funds. There was not enough right. discovery, knowledge, or sourcing, or understanding of individual stocks, and costs were really high. Uh, technology was such that you had to call brokers. Over time, costs came down, and information got distributed. So now you have everything from free trading, effectively free trading, to people just like going in there being very comfortable. And I think we're in the very beginning of that trend where it's like 70s mutual fund style going towards do it yourself. And this generation of uh, kids and, uh, and you know, Gen Xers, they want, they grew up digital. So they want to do it themselves. They want to be the decision makers. They don't want to let someone else necessarily give them all the information. They like the fun of it. If you think about it, it's pretty ironic that, you know, you can easily access risky asset classes like, let's say crypto or, you know, sophisticated uh, stuff like option trading and growing food and things like that as an individual investor. And if you want to invest on, let's say, a KKR fund or something that is supposed to be very reliable, that private equity has been outperformed public markets for the last you know, two decades, that these guys know what they do and they're very conservative, but they're at the same time very good at what they do. And this is not accessible at all. So this is a, a bit of a contradiction, right? So, so hopefully that opens, you know, making those products accessible to people. It also helps people to diversify their portfolio. They can have a little bit of crypto, they can have a little bit of public stocks, but they also have, you know, private equity VCs or, or private markets in general. You look at like you look at all of these investors out there who now have you know their crypto accounts and their self-hosted wallets and so on, and they're engaging in that crypto economy. And they're getting older, they're getting wealthier, they're getting more involved in the economy, and eventually they're going to want that use case experience in terms of how to have their access, how to hold it on the blockchain, how to put it in a wallet, right? So there's a, a significant uh, generational development that will further, I think, help to expand that. Yeah, and I guess instead of keeping things as it was, um, maybe we can start with John on this because you were for Avalanche, which was part of Avalanche. Um, in terms of Web3 and blockchain technology, how does that provide this like efficiency that you mentioned before and that you're all talking about like going forward? What's What makes it so special? Yeah, so in a permissionless blockchain or in a blockchain, you basically have one source of truth and that data that is on there is validated by everyone. And then everyone works off of that one source of truth. You know, in the traditional Web2 world, everyone has their own servers, their own databases. You have the API in to share information. There's a lot of paper, workflow, all of this stuff. And I'm sure people who are banking with JP Morgan, when they want to send things around their internal funds or to other people at JP Morgan, it's very easy. But once you want to wire or do things to SWIFT, to someone in Europe, or to even <coughs> Wells Fargo, Suddenly it takes a lot of time, days, if not a week to send money around. Um, and you have to like fill out everything exactly correct, especially for international SWIFT. And it takes a long time. So having everyone working off of a blockchain provides that efficiency. The transparency of it means you don't need, it makes the accountants' lives a lot easier. They, everything is open for them to see. But one truth is source, they can trust it. Um, you know, the enforcement of things are done through algorithms on the smart contract. So therefore the lawyer's jobs are easier as well. If you're a servicer trying to send out paperwork to for funds or, or whatever, 
suddenly you have easy access to the data as well. And frankly, if you're an individual, you can go out there and see it. And then also perhaps, you know, there was more liquidity after a year after Reg D allows you to have liquidity and there'll be a better market. And once there's a better market for that, there'll be more liquidity and hopefully better price discovery for some of these assets. I think people don't realize that the, the reason why capital markets are inefficient is basically for, for two specific reasons. One is because it's, it's very difficult to prove ownership of something in a very you know, uh, efficient and, and uh, in a revocable way, right? So proving, you call it like, I don't know, a rowing account and you buy Apple shares, it's very, it would be very hard for you to actually prove that you actually own those Apple shares, even if you have them in your Robinhood account, because they're probably under you know, the DTC and then you know, the street name of the broker dealer, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, private markets are even worse <coughs> than that, right? So something as simple as, you know, how do I prove I own this? This is the basic use case of a public blockchain, right? Because it's a ledger at the end of the day. It's a, it's a cryptographically secure public ledger where you can report things efficiently. So that's number one. And number two is how do you actually move it around, right? So, so that's the other, like say, main thing that uh, uh, blockchain does, which is allows for this transfer of ownership represented on the blockchain into, you know, another uh, investor, another uh, user of the of the blockchain in an efficient way and applying in a programmable way, right? You can apply rules and fly, which, you know, that's where compliance and et cetera comes out. And so these, these kind of two things is what makes this kind of like the ultimate platform for representing securities and all the, you know, distribution and trading goes along. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, so for example, onboarding on a securitized platform, you create a securitized ID, you're ID'd once as an accre accredited investor or a QP. At that point in time, you don't have to do that again. You can use that ID for any other of the products that you want to invest in. And then when you think about the digital transfer agent side, back to what Carlos was saying, right? It's easier to transfer, it's easier to move. You know, when you look at the, the, tip, the traditional transfer agent process and the technology that's involved there, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of lawyers, a lot of time, a lot of inefficiencies, right? And so all of a sudden you have something where it's, you know, controlled by smart contracts, instant transfers, much more efficient, much more cost effective and a better user experience. So that behind the scenes is, is, is key. And the last thing I'll say is that operationally at asset managers, when Web3 comes in, it's not just a technology. Right? It changes the way that things happen. It changes the way that people need to think about their operations, their workflows. And, you know, and the more people that are looking at this closely, the more they're realizing, wow, we did that with 200 people and now we need five. Right? And so there's efficiencies that are being realized. And I think as that starts to come to light, that you're going to see the, the sort of economic imperative, especially in tough times, to adopt this more aggressively. It's a very much better experience for the individual. I mean, um, very simple example. If you're an investor with 10 different funds that you're invested in, you can expect three to four capital calls per, per fund. So that's 30 to 40 different times you have to go to your bank, create wire instructions, copy, paste, send emails, wait for that phone call from your bank, val and, and, and validate that amount and the person and the, you know, all the bank codes that you're sending it to. I mean, how much would anyone here uh, take back you know, their time like that 30 or 40 times a year. I mean, no one has time to do that. I think that efficiency is where it's going to start. But the exciting thing is not just the, the efficiency that it's going to bring, but what are the new use cases and applications to securities that have not been possible because of how the market is structured today? And if you want to make a parallelism uh, with music, I think that, uh, you're too young, but I remember when we have LPs, right? Like the vinyl LPs and then the compact disc in the 80s came up. And that was digital music, right? It was an MP3 file copied on a, on a disc. But still at the beginning, it didn't radically change the, the music industry, right? You still have a physical disc. Yes, it was a smaller. Yes, you could jump from song to song and the quality was slightly better. But it was still physical. You still have to go to, you know, Virgin Megastore, Tower Records, purchase it. Uh, you still have to carry it around. You have to buy the top songs, etc. But people then realize, well, there's a native digital representation of the music and of the song. And that means I can do all the stuff that I can do before. I can carry a thousand songs on my pocket, which is the famous iPod advertising that Apple had. And then the second thing is, well, I can actually purchase the, the songs uh, online through the internet. And then I don't have to buy the entire album. I can just buy one song and then music streaming and all those things that completely change how people consume music um, in the world and how the industry is structured around, right? So, so my expectation is that this is, will not be just an efficiency play, but it will also be about you know, opening up for new applications and, and basically this, this long tail of capital markets that doesn't exist today, right? But capital markets are like a very, very, you know, thing for 
for institutions on one side and, and you know large asset managers from the other side and they're not accessible for for everyday investors or smaller uh, companies. I guess we've been talking about like a lot of positives and I'm, I'm an optimist myself, but uh, I guess in the present moment, there are definitely untapped investor pools as all three of you, I'm sure you're aware. So what are the problems that persist today that are acting as barriers? How do you see the industry getting over that and moving forward? I mean, up until you know, this particular deal with KKR, frankly. Uh, and this is one of the first of its kind in the U.S., especially with such a great, you know, um, firm as KKR. But up until now, frankly, there was some adverse selection of funds who wanted to do it through this mechanism. Um, that's an issue. Also, some of the problems are, frankly, from the user perspective. Um, how do they research? How do they source these things? And do they really understand the underlying mechanism well enough. So there's some education that has to come along with this process for the individuals as well. I think user experience of blockchain has a bit of a you know, long ways to go um, in terms of making it easier, more seamless. And I always think that at some point, you know, companies like Google or Apple are just gonna integrate your crypto wallets on your phones and that will be the day that, you know, it will be very seamless to use uh, crypto and to, you know, purchase tokens, whether they're securities or not. If you guys remember, when when internet started at the beginning, it was very clunky to connect to internet. Right? You have to have a modem and you have to download TCP/IP software stack into your computer because it didn't work. It wasn't there, except And today, you know, you you open your phone and it's connected to the internet. You don't even realize that you're connecting to the internet. It's all seamless, right? So I think that kind of seamless connection into this next year, you know version of the internet, which is the public blockchains, is still not there. And until it's not there, there's always going to be a barrier of entry for a certain uh, type of people. So hopefully this will change within the next you know, few years. Well, I think this is really about sort of traditional financial institutions getting comfortable with blockchain technology and all of the applications of that. And, um, you know, and the, the beauty is that great progress is happening there and it's moving in the right direction. But they're going to be a little bit slower, a little bit more conservative, a little bit more, you know, risk programs all in place in, inside of those organizations. And so those things, you know, they they, uh, they can slow it down a little bit, but nonetheless, I think all those things are starting to, to starting to uh, move out of the way. Also, there's regulatory change that needs to happen, right? So, a lot of the rules, uh, especially in the U.S., around let's say uh, funds, are, are very restrictive in terms of who can actually purchase units of the funds, how many investors you can have per fund, uh, etc. And then, in, in 2014, in the U.S., uh, during the Obama administration, they passed something called the Jobs Act, which made it created two new exemptions for registration of securities, one called regulation and crowdfunding, Reg CF, and the other one called Reg Plus, that facilitated how people could invest, you know, directly into companies, into startups, which is great, and that has been, you know, growing tremendously uh, and doing very well. I think that, you know, the day we see something like that, but for funds, this is when this that part of the space will explode, right? Because as an individual investor, I rather invest on a fund than on an individual company, right? Because unless you're very good at what you do, it's very hard to pick uh, the right company, and then you also don't diversify, etc. So, so I think that you know to see the the, the job sack version for for funds is probably something hopefully that we'll see in the next few years, and that change will change the, the investment landscape. So it's interesting that that's a blocker for all private funds, right? Not just blockchain private Correct. funds. Correct. No, but not just a blockchain yeah, no. But but the thing is, right? So when blockchain is coming in and it's making it, you know, easier for a lower price point, easier for more people to get involved, all of a sudden, I think the pressure to kind of open it up a little bit more is going to be there now more, right? Because there's just demand for these sorts of private. Mean, everybody is seeing, you know, the amount of the amount of private funds that are out there, the upside that you can get in investing in those pro products versus public market products. There's there's significant increasing demand. It is a growing space. Uh, the price point is coming down. Blockchain is enabling it, and so really that's a key area where regulation should make you know sort of, sort of block stop blocking the amount of access to a number of investors there. It's ironic that only the richest people are access are, are you know have access to the best products. Right? It should be the other way around. <laughs> like the, the best product should be available to everybody. So everybody has the same opportunities to, you know, make money and, and increase their savings. Yeah, um, I, I'm glad you guys brought up regulation because I want to talk about regulation and compliance. And I know you all have your share of like uh, time with that effort. Uh, and Brett, I know you worked for the SEC in the past, even though you were at JP Morgan for much longer. Um, and Carlos, you have compliance and so it's strong. Like all three of you work in this. 
So what is kind of needed for LPs and institutions to engage with crypto in a compliant manner? Is there a framework right now or like, is there a way to go? Like, is there, are we a long way away? I think unless there is 100% regulatory clarity, large institutions will not touch the space because the, the risk is not worth the reward, right? So, so there is a lot of stuff out there that, you know, it's interesting from a return perspective, like you say, DeFi protocols, et cetera, but at the same time, for all you know, you could be transacting with somebody in North Korea, right? So if you're an individual investor, you probably don't care and don't think anybody's going to come after you. But if you're an institution um, and you think about like you manage, let's say, your KKR, you manage half a trillion dollars, even if you can make, I don't know, a 20% return on 100 million of those, the, the risk of your firm like being uh, shut down or, 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 you know, getting sanctions from the U.S. government because you're transacting in, with people you're not supposed to be, is just too high, right? So. I think that unavoidable, this has to be not just regulation, which I think is already there, but it's also that a lot of the companies in the crypto space, they actually do follow regulations. So because sometimes, you know, people complain about the, the lack of regulatory clarity. But I think if you, if you balance these two things, there is, you know, more regulatory clarity than actually people following regulations. It's the, the, the opposite is what's happening the, the most. So and that is preventing institutions from broadly adopting, you know, crypto assets in, in general. But, but I think it's, it's important, I totally agree with that, it's important to differentiate between traditional financial products using blockchain as a tool to do all the things that we've been talking about, and then what is the world of crypto per se, right? So in crypto, all those points, spot on, I'm sure that these topics have been brought up many, many times uh, over the course of events here in the last couple of days. But I would say that for these private products and the application of blockchain and securitize, and this example with, you know, with Avalanche is a, is a perfect example. KKR is doing this by the book. It is a, you know, it's an exempt security. They're following the regulations. It's on a platform. Ultimately, when it comes to the ATS, that's a registered broker dealer ATS, right? And so in, there's a certain space where things can happen within the sort of legal regulated landscape, right? And then there is sort of, okay, well, where is the edge of that? And how are we chipping away at that? And it, and it gets much more complicated when you talk about sort of registered securities, registered funds, and then ultimately crypto products that are very different than your typical equity securities that have DeFi elements and other aspects to them, right? So, but in many respects, there is there is a path for a number of these private securities. And I think that's that's the niche that you're seeing this product being you know, launched here today. I think from a technology perspective, while we're getting to that comfort level in terms of regulation and compliance, and I know uh, Carlos is very excited about the Avalanche subnet construct, a subnet is kind of like a blockchain as a service. It's basically uh, issuers could spin up their own blockchain on top of Avalanche. So you have the security benefits of the Avalanche protocol, but you can choose your validator set and who the validators are. And therefore you can embed into that network the right compliance based on geography, types of securities, and know the people that are in there so that you guys can all work together. Um, that is something from a technology perspective that we thought about to help solve for some of the uncertainty in regulation right now. Let the participants figure out who they're comfortable with in terms of and what assets are comfortable in terms of transacting. Uh, Carlos, you said something that was like 100% of institutions, unless there's 100% regulation, institutions, regulatory clarity. <laughs> regulatory clarity, institutions will not touch this. Um, and maybe I'm a little confused, but why is KKR touching it then? Well, because as, as Brett said, what KKR is doing is, uh, is touching digital asset securities. In other words, these are digital assets mm -hmm. issued on a public blockchain that represent securities. So the entire you know, process is completely legal. I, just, uh, you know, I started talking to people at KKR in 2018. Mm -hmm. At that time, they would not have done what they've done today for a number of reasons. One is because you know, we as a company were not regulated. So we became regulated and got a registered transfer in 2019 and a broker dealer, et cetera. So we do have now licenses to be able to deal with, you know, securities on the blockchain in a regulated way. And then the second is that there was, there's been more regulatory clarity from the SEC, especially when Brett was there, um, in terms of what you can do or not with digital asset securities. So what I, what I was referring to is that, you know, outside of these products that are clearly regulated on the blockchain, there's a bunch of other digital assets that are unregulated. Those are the ones that I don't think that KKR will be comfortable touching. 
because the, the risks of those products, are, uh, like let's say some of the DeFi protocols, etc., are, are too high for them versus the, the potential return. What we do is 100% regulated, so it should not be problematic for anyone. I mean, you see, you see small developments here, right? So, for example, there's it's pretty clear that Bitcoin is not considered a security. It's more considered a commodity. So you'll see Fidelity, for example, talking about putting that into, you know, enabling that to be in the 401k. You're seeing some institutions that are creating crypto funds that they can offer to, for example, accredited investors um, that will include various crypto. And they go through a very rigorous process to try to determine that none of those are securities. Um, but there is risk there, right? So there was something very recently where you know, one of them actually had a fund out there. And then all of a sudden there was some question as to whether some of the components of that fund were indeed securities. Right. And so that's a problem, right? If you're thinking about putting a fund together that has, you know, crypto assets in it, and you, you don't know if next week, all of a sudden there's going to be an enforcement action for, uh, you know, the chairman or anybody else is going to come out and say, these three products are now securities and they're part of a, of a fund or something like that, then that becomes problematic. So we definitely need, you know, more progress, more of a push there, both from the commission, the CFTC, um, on the Hill and so on. And, you know, and it feels like it's moving, but, you know, as the political uh, sausage making process is, it's always more cumbersome and slow than we would like. Yeah. In regards to Web3 and blockchain, we've been talking about this this whole time, but um, for institutions and LPs, where is it going to go in the short term? Are you optimistic? I mean, we have this today. What's next? Well, hopefully many more will come. As, <laughs> as you were asking before, uh, you know, yes, we are talking to other asset managers and, and you, know, you need to get the first one to the finish line for the other ones to, to move. So hopefully this, this will start a trend that will really uh, start changing uh, the adoption uh, uh, levels. So, and that, you know, how long is this going to take? I don't know. It's not going to be immediate. Like everybody in technology tends to think that every new technology gets adopted faster than the previous one. But I think when it touches things that are regulated and that are, are economic in nature, like financial services, it usually takes a lot longer uh, than expected. But, you know, I've been in this industry for, uh, for a few years now, and, and I can tell you, the, the level of uh, excitement that I see now in, in the space versus like two or four years ago is completely different. So I, I definitely think that this is a tipping point where we're going to see adoption given increasing budgets. I can tell you in the short term, I've already gotten three texts from friends of mine from large asset management firms wanting to have lunch um, after we started this panel. So I know where we're going in the short term. There's going to be more inquiry and hopefully more adoption and, and using this type of construct going forward. Um, I can tell you, I think in five years from now, um, I've been saying this for a long time because of the efficiency and how eloquent tokenization is. We're going to go into a point where all those four trends conflate and really inflect, and then we're going to have what I call hyper tokenization. Anything that has value and anything that has a cash flow associated can be easily tokenized because it's just an easier way to issue, own, and then transfer those assets. So in five, six years from now, this is going to be the primary way of doing a lot of things, I think. It's absolutely right. Like, I, I sort of have this typology of the evolution of the asset management industry, right? And so asset management, I would say sort of asset management 1.0 is the typical way of distributing products through wealth managers. Asset management 2.0 is kind of when you think about like your yield streets and your fund rises. And now you've got these other folks who are out there and they're saying, we can actually bring a lot of these private market products from our website directly to a much broader uh, group of potential investors that, you know, um, you know, leveraging the internet, right? And three, is when you get to the point where asset managers are saying, okay, we have the opportunity now to leverage blockchain to do some of these very same things, right? And so when they see the opportunity in terms of leveraging blockchain, bringing down costs and having a direct connectivity to the customer, right? I actually think that we're gonna see some of these going direct to customer, not necessarily, potentially this is to the thing we talked about earlier, disintermediation, right? That there's a potential disintermediation play here where asset managers can get tokens into wallets of individual customers that then they can communicate with, they can give rewards to, they can have a relationship with, which doesn't really exist in sort of that asset management 1.0 typology. So this is something that, that uh, Jeremy Allaire from Circle explains a lot better than I do, but I'm going to give it a try. Um, if you think about why internet as a public utility was relevant, it's because it basically created this very efficient marketplace for certain things that were difficult to, you know, much you know, supply with demand, right? Like advertising is a typical example. Before internet existed, 
you know, there was no efficient way to do advertising if you were a small business, right? Like if you have a restaurant, in, you know, here in a, in a corner of the city of New York, there was no efficient way for you to just advertise and target your specific audience, right? And vice versa, if you were a large corporation and say Coca-Cola, you could do mass advertising, but you were also advertising to people that consume Pepsi Cola, right? So, so there was no way for you to like segment a uh, better way. And the internet somehow created this, this very efficient platform for matching supply and demand and creating the long tail of advertising, which as opposed to what people thought, advertising industry actually became bigger after the internet than before. People thought the internet was going to destroy the advertising business and it was the opposite, right? And the same thing applies to, you know, communications, commerce, you know, food delivery and, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, other industries that these, these very efficient marketplaces create a long tail of these industries that didn't exist before. So if you think about capital markets, as we discussed before, capital markets today, they don't have the long tail of capital markets. If you're an asset manager, you go for institutional investors. So, and if you're a small business, you don't have access to capital markets. You're a small investor, you don't have access to the best products in capital markets. So hopefully blockchain is kind of like the next version of the internet, the next version of this public utility that has these features that allows to transact with things that represent value in a very efficient way, will create this long tail of capital markets that will actually make capital markets way bigger than they are today. And what kind of like financial uh, like products or services we see today in private markets, do you think will be replaced by like Web3 and blockchain technology? Or do you think they'll kind of work together in the future? I, I, in the near future, they'll be working together. Mm -hmm. um, everything, obviously we're talking about an alternative fund right now, um, but there's private shares, there's real estate assets, there's debt, you know, structure, finance, derivatives. So I think for now, you still need the underlying asset, of course and to um, work hand in hand. But there'll be cases where there's almost like two share classes. One share class trades slightly different than the other one, because one's more liquid or less liquid. And um, one has slightly different um, liquidity than, than the other. So therefore there's pricing differences. Hopefully we'll see new functionality, right? So, so liquidity obviously is an aspect of it. So today, you know, if you want to transact and secondary market with an LP position is a very cumbersome process. It's, you know, and it's all paper-based. It requires a lot of lawyers involved in each side. It's difficult to match the, the supply with the demand, to do price discovery, etc. Because there's no, you know, there's no digital version of it. There's no like a, a digital marketplace that enables you to do that. So that will, you know, hopefully improve and it will allow you know smaller positions and in a much more efficient way uh, to deal with uh, with secondary market. But I think we're also going to see new products appear that maybe were not efficient to create when you have inefficiencies in how you distribute those products or or the type of investors that you can access it. And, and a simple example could be, you know, you go to a restaurant, this is your favorite restaurant, and then, you know, why not being able to invest in the restaurant instead of like tipping at the restaurant, right? Like, so suppose in a scenario where, you know, you walk into your favorite restaurants and there's a QR code on the table with the menu, but another QR code, it says like, you can invest in our equity. And then, you know, you have your crypto wallet there, you know, you take a QR code, you, you know, scan your ID, the pass KYC in a seamless way, you know, and then send some stable coin USDC or whatever and receive a token that represents equity on the restaurant. And moreover, that token then is a proof of ownership into a portion of the restaurant that they can use for like giving you rewards and they can like give all sort of all the stuff that today would be impossible to do with the, the current tools that we have uh, at hand, right? So hopefully Web3 will not be only about let's make more efficient and more accessible to these products, but also like you know, enabling new products that don't exist today. The yeah, I mean, caveat, restaurants are usually bad investments, but I think this product is a very good investment. <laughs> or the very gym or whatever other business. Or so like, why not when I go to Walmart, you know, and, you know, or Apple, or Apple store, why not being able to, you know, buy an iPhone and, you know, $10 in shares and then receive them in my, on my wallet as tokens. And then next time I go there, maybe I get a discount because I'm a shareholder. holder. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we can think about because it's, it's impossible oh, to absolutely. enable it today that might be, uh, feasible in the future when this technology is more predominant. Right, so access to more products that can be, that can come out as securities or tokens that people can buy. And I think one thing that I, I wouldn't sort of ignore is that when you look at like one of the biggest developments in terms of how people access the marketplace or access funds is ETFs, right? So exchange traded funds, when they came in, all of a sudden you had tax advantages, you had the ability to trade funds that otherwise weren't tradable real time, intraday, right? And 
you know, I, I think that we are going to see ETFs go to BTFs, like some blockchain traded funds. You're going to have a blockchain based product. It's going to package these things. It's going to make it easier to trade products, whether they be alt or unregistered securities on secondary markets or other assets traded on secondary markets because they're going to be on the blockchain and because the technology enables that. Right. So I think if you look at how significant the transformation of ETFs were, then you really have to be thinking about how when this moves to the blockchain, how that packaging will, will have a significant effect on who are some of the dominant players in the asset management business. Last question for you guys. I'm going to give you a baseball analogy. Where are we? Are we batting? Are we on first base? Like, where is the adoption for LPs and institutions? I'm from Spain, so I have no idea about baseball, but we're very early. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what would be soccer. I don't know. <laughs> the I don't first keep up five with minutes soccer. of the game. So we're very early. Like, look, this is the, what, what we're announcing today is like the first, you know, major private equity institution putting a portion of their fund in the blockchain. So this is how early we are, right? Like, if you think about alternative assets, you're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars, and now we're talking about like you know, uh, tens of millions that are moving into the blockchain. So we're very early on from an adoption perspective, but I think we've gone a long journey in terms of developing the infrastructure. That's what people don't realize that both the te technical infrastructure as well as the regulatory infrastructure is what has been the build out these years. Now the adoption uh, is coming, but yes, we're very early. <laughs> so I know baseball, so I can, yeah. I can work with that <laughs> a little bit. And you know, first of all, first inning, right? First inning, top of the first. Um, and what we just saw was, you know, Carlos and John putting together a product today where they walk up to the bat and Boom, they pounded out. They just nailed a good double, right? It's a good double. It might not be the home run yet, but, but it is a significant <laughs> development. You know, we are on base. We are moving, and this is a good game. That's I've early. never been able to explain <laughs> that that way. <laughs> it, it's, it's very early. I mean, the whole space is still very early. Um, I know people throughout these numbers, like there's like 40 million people who own Bitcoin in the U.S., and there's like 300, 250 million people who are uh, owners of crypto assets around the world. But those are just uh, speculators or, or, or owners. They're not real users of the space. This is a real world asset coming to the space. This is a real use case. So from a use case perspective, this is like Amazon in 1998, 99, where there was less than 15 million shoppers on Amazon, you know? Um, and don't forget during the bear market of 2000 to 2003, even though Amazon's price went to single digits, you know, affectionately called the single digit midget, but they uh, increased their user base from 15 million by the end of 2003 or four in the down market to like 45 million users. So the space is going to grow regardless of asset prices. Okay. Well, I guess if we have this conversation in a year's time, hopefully things look a little bit different. Uh, Carlos, Brett, John, thank you so much for joining Thanks, me on stage here today. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.